everyone, and welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I am Andrew's younger daughter, and on today's show I'm going to be reading Chapter 5 from my granddad's book, Around the Horn by Frank Downs. Chapter 5 covers Touring RAF Stations, Central Band on the March, Bristol, Birmingham, Cardiff and other major cities. Spit and polish was, and is still, I suppose, considered to be an accepted and essential part of a serviceman's life. It certainly was a major part in the case of a bandsman, though in my case, as a brass player, it was rather a case of brasso rather than spit. Whether it was a church parade and service, or leading a march through a town or city, instruments had to positively gleam. An inspection would be made by the bandmaster before any such parade, and woe betide anyone who had failed such scrutiny. Irritating as it was for me to have to spend a whole afternoon or evening cleaning a French horn, I felt really sorry for poor colleagues slaving away at a brass bass. More exasperating still was the fact that frequently it would rain on the actual parade. The effect of rain drying on a wet brass instrument was disastrous, resulting in smudges and smears which were incredibly difficult to remove. In spite of all these exasperating occasions, however, I was always conscious of the fact that I was extremely fortunate to be able to continue towards a career in music. Air raids on London in those early months of 1941 were continuous, both day and night. Fire watching duties were frequent, and sadly I remember being on such duty one night with a group of West Indian musicians from Ken Snake Hips Johnson's band, who were at that time resident at the Café de Paris. They still played in the band, duties permitting. But two nights later, they were killed by a direct hit on that establishment. It was shortly after this that my first opportunity came to play in the orchestra, playing second horn to Dennis Brain. Based at Abingdon Aerodrome, we were to tour RAF stations in the area of Oxfordshire, culminating in a final public concert in Oxford Town Hall. The concerts were to be conducted by Wing Commander O'Donnell and John Hollingsworth, who was to fill the role of his assistant. There was a sense of relief on leaving London. Perhaps most of us thought we might get a few quiet nights. How wrong we were! Arriving mid-afternoon and having received a warm and friendly welcome from the entertainment officer in the camp, we were given the ground floor area in one of a group of barrack blocks at the far end of the aerodrome. Beds were set out in the usual barrack room pattern, and one thing which stands out in my memory of that afternoon was seeing a fiddle player, I think it was Gerald Ems, take out a large tin of Keating's powder and proceed to sprinkle his pallias liberally and thoroughly. It was a practice he always followed, I was told, much to the amusement of his colleagues. He was taking no chances. It would be around 10 o'clock that evening when several of us were preparing to get into bed. In fact, I had one leg in my pyjama trousers when there was the most unholy bang. An ominous whistling noise, a noise which millions by now recognised. Bombs. I instinctively dived under my bed for cover. Unfortunately, my colleague in the next bed had the same idea, but chose my bed also for cover, resulting in a clash of heads midway. It was all over in seconds. Miraculously, our building sustained little damage. Windows were shattered in our coach outside, but other barrack blocks were not so fortunate, and there were casualties. Both Dennis Matthews and Dennis Brain had narrow escapes. On their way back from the village pub and near the main entrance to the camp, they were blown off their feet by the explosions. Neither seemed any the worse for the experience, however. 
and I remember Dennis Matthews keeping us awake into the early hours with his inexhaustible repertoire of stories. Playing in the orchestra next to Dennis Brain for the first time was an incredible experience. His flawless technique, deep and penetrating musicianship, his innate modesty, warm and friendly personality were, I found, refreshing. His virtuosity not only applied to his horn playing, he was also a fine organist. At an RAF Benevolent concert in the Albert Hall, he played the Bach D minor prelude and fugue in the first half, and after the interval, the first horn concerto of Richard Strauss, both from memory. The great organist G.D. Cunningham, who was his teacher at the Royal Academy, expressed the view many times that Dennis was one of his most talented pupils. He was very much in demand throughout those days at Uxbridge, particularly by the film studios. The marvellous horn playing in Henry V was one occasion which readily comes to mind. In later months, mainly because of RAF duties, I was unable to have consistent lessons at the Royal College, and I was delighted when Dennis agreed to give me lessons. These were nearly always at my cousin's house in Uxbridge High Street, where he would usually stay and have a meal before riding off home on his bicycle. In the course of my orchestral career we met several times when he came to play concertos in Liverpool and Birmingham. Outstanding in my memories of those occasions was a concert in Liverpool with the Philharmonic Orchestra in 1947 in which he and Frederick Grinker played the Ethel Smythe double concerto for violin and horn. Eugene Goossens was the guest conductor and it was a truly remarkable performance. It was broadcast in the BBC Third programme, and the horn chords were played with the perfection one always associated with Dennis. I have never heard that concerto since, though Aubrey, his father, for whom it was written, played it several years beforehand. The extraordinary thing about Dennis's visits to Birmingham to play with the BBC Midland Orchestra was that there always seemed to be an element of crisis. I recall three such occasions. The first was when he arrived to play the fourth concerto of Mozart, and the orchestra had the parts to the Richard Strauss first concerto. No problem, he said. I'll play the Strauss. He did. The next occasion was an outside broadcast from Nottingham University, scheduled for 3.45 in the afternoon. Rehearsal was due to begin at 1.45pm. At 2.45, still no Dennis. At 3pm, he arrived with apologies. He had broken down on the M1. He took his instrument out of its case and, without any further ado, began the Gordon Jacob Concerto for Horn and Strings. Rehearsal finished at 3.30. A quick cup of tea and he was on the air. Finally, he came to play a concerto on an outside broadcast from Nuffield House at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. It was one of a series of programmes called Music to Remember. No musical disaster this time, but he was very worried and concerned. Before he had left London, his baby boy had swallowed a safety pin and was in hospital. Happily, however, by the end of the broadcast, he received the good news that all was well. He had a fascination for cars, particularly fast ones. Back in the RAF days, he invariably had some car magazine or other on his music stand during rehearsals, and this continued to be the case in later years. There was the amusing story which his colleagues in the Philharmonia often relate about the occasion when recording the Beethoven Pastoral Symphony with Carrion. He failed to make an entry in the scherzo during a rehearsal. Mr Brain, Mr Brain, protested the maestro. What is the matter? It's all right, maestro, came a voice from the brass section. He's turned over two pages of the auto car by mistake. Returning again to the war years, we toured extensively, visiting RAF stations, operational and training. Filton Aerodrome, home of the Bristol Aircraft Company, comes to mind as one of the most embarrassing memories we were stationed there for a fortnight for public concerts, propaganda marches in different areas of Bristol, and a workers' playtime broadcast from the works canteen. Our accommodation was in Nissen huts on the aerodrome perimeter, and I think it must have been only our second or third night there when the aerodrome was attacked. Most of us were in bed, though few were asleep. 
as intermittent anti-aircraft fire around the city signified enemy aircraft in the vicinity. Quite suddenly, the attack on the aerodrome began and the station radio blared out its warning message. Air raid warning red! Air raid warning red! All airmen proceed to shelters! As we did not know where the shelters were, there was general confusion as lights were extinguished at the main switch by the orderly sergeant. I leapt out of bed and searched for my trousers which I usually kept under my pillow to keep them creased. Alas, this very night I had hung them up near my bedside locker. They had disappeared. Completely disorientated by the blackout, panic set in amongst us. The only defence I had was my tin hat. I grabbed it and ran outside clad in my pyjamas and finally arrived at a shelter, much to the amusement of the other airmen. It wasn't amusing for me the next morning, however, when I had to explain my conduct and loss of trousers, which incidentally were never found. There is a humorous anecdote of ancient origin associated with the black country town of Dudley. It tells of the man in Upper Gornal who put his pig on the wall to watch the band march by. I actually witnessed a very similar event in Bristol whilst playing on a bandstand in the Bedminster area. On a warm summer evening with deck chairs filled with appreciative listeners, we were halfway through Sousa's Liberty Bell when lo and behold, sitting on a wall behind the row of chairs, there appeared what I assumed was a family consisting of parents and several children. Not the conventional family, however. Perched in the middle was a real-life pig. And what seems incredible is that it sat there for almost all of the programme, which ended with the 1812 overture. We had the greatest difficulty in concentrating, particularly our poor cornet soloist, who had to face the spectacle directly in front of him as he played Carnival of Venice. Bill Overton, the soloist, always said that he had to play with his eyes closed, and that throughout his later career as principal trumpet of the BBC Symphony Orchestra, he had never felt so uncomfortable. The more we travelled around the country, the more we realised how necessary it was to have a sense of humour in those grim, wartime days. I remember being stationed at Innsworth Lane, Gloucester, which was an RAF technical training area, and two events occurred there worthy of noting in my diary. On the first occasion, I was wandering round the camp one afternoon, being free before the evening concert, and I stopped outside a large technical training workshop. The doors were wide open, understandably, as it was a hot, humid sort of day. A lecture was taking place, addressed to RAF flight mechanics, who, I presumed, were recruits. A bunch of them were gathered around a flight sergeant, and I paused for a few minutes to listen at the doorway. There are 180 degrees in a circle, he said confidently to his listeners. But Sergeant, there are 360, an equally confident bright recruit called out. There was a deathly pause. Well, said the flight sergeant, this is a bloody small circle. My second enduring memory is of a scandalous and comic situation. It was scandalous in disciplinary terms when one considers the facts of the case. An airman was found in the WAF quarters by an orderly officer just before midnight. The charge was that he was found in bed with a WAF. When the case came before the commanding officer a few days later, his defence was that the WAF had rather a bad headache and he had gone there to give her some aspirin. This defence made even the CO laugh. End of chapter 5 Since we have heard about the performances of many horn concertos in this episode, I am going to end this podcast with movement 1 of Andrew Downs' Concerto for Four Horns and Symphony Orchestra, which came into my mind when I heard the rhythmic opening of Gordon Jacobs' Concerto for Horn and Strings. Andrew Downs composed this work for the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra and it was first performed by them with soloists Radek Babarak, Stanislav Suchinek, Andrei Vrabets and Zdenek Divaki, conducted by Vladimir Valek in the Vorjak Hall of the Rudolfinum Prague Czech Republic 
on the 28th of February 2002. The work was recorded by the same soloists with the Czech Radio Orchestra and broadcast on Czech Radio in March 2003. This is the recording you are about to hear. The programme note to the first performance began by saying The British composer Andrew Downes ranks today among the internationally acclaimed personalities. Dr David Wright of Music Web International wrote about the concerto that it is a truly staggering piece.